Constructed in 1845, the Railways of Jamaica was the second British colony after Canada to receive a railway system. Jamaica also had one of the first public passenger trains in the world. In 1957, the worst rail disaster in Jamaica's history and the second in the world took place. The story began with a planned all-day excursion in Montego Bay St. James by the St. Annis Church in Kingston. In 1957, Woodrow Patterson was five years old. As children, woke up in the morning, quite excited, um, early, you know, got up early. In fact, I wore that day um, a multicolored shirt I can remember that my mother had sewn, because in fact she, um, she, is, uh, she was an excellent um, dressmaker. And my pants was basically, guess what you'd call these days, um, a Bermuda shorts and I wore my black and white shoes. So you, you see I was, as they say, trash and ready. And, um, and so we all went to the, uh, the railway station. And I recall that it was very crowded, extremely crowded. Matter of fact, I heard, I mean, in, in, the, in the sort of wash up, you know, to the incident and so on, that it could have been over, over um, subscribed. It was really crowded. So we got on the last coach. <laughs> and, um, and so off we went to um, Montego Bay which is where this picnic was. There were actually three families of us, really, that went, 18, that total about 18. There was the Pattersons, the Nicholsons, and the Skyers. On September 1, 1957, the train with 12 wooden carriages left the train station in downtown Kingston for Montego Bay. wended its way from Kingston to the Spanish Town and Gregory Park stations before pulling into the Bushy Park Hall. It was a good driver and he was very careful, but there was still so much wrongdoing in on the train, you know, because the, the roughnecks were on it, the, the, the Kingston hooligans, and they were behaving very bad. As it goes on, unauthorized people were hopping onto the train, like out by Bushy Park, or by, before you get into Old Harbor, there, people were hopping on the train. Traveling to Montego Bay from Kingston, was an exciting ride for those who boarded the train. The journey was as exciting as was the destination. Families and friends were able to experience the beauty of the Jamaican countryside. Some had front row seats to a canvas of colors as the train rolled through the hills and valleys on its way to the beach and small town life in Montego Bay. Still, others settled back in their seats, savoring the experience of traveling on a train. We reach Mobile, we are right now, Mobile. We go sign lanes, we are drink, and then we are forcing the world. After a fun filled day at the beach, it was time to return to Kingston. But there was a problem. Each coach is allowed to carry 80 people. 
1,600 people boarded the train at 6 in the evening. This meant there were approximately 130 people per car. We took our seats, all of my friends and myself took our seats. But then the Roughnecks came in and they said we had taken up their seat and their girlfriend's seat. And so when the train pulled out, what they're going to do, they're going to kiss us and I'm going to hug us and they're going to do this and that. So I got upset and I started crying. One particular guy said that he was going to cut the line for the light to get the train in darkness that he could probably do things with the girls. Enjoyed ourselves, had a good day. And on the return journey, I remember I was in my mother's lap. And um, there were people there, you know, in and out of sleep because it was a long day. And I recall, as young as I was, you know, I observed a man who was sort of, from all what it looks, was molesting some females. Them time, when, when I tell him, you can't find one of my cousins now, when me and him go. So he start walk, walk my chain. I look for him, I find him. I believe the photo last coach, I find him. And I tell my friend, I say, I don't leave the coach here because my cousin here, when I come, I'm in mean, the sleep and I can get drunk, you get me? But then, you know, I can't get no space on the coach to sleep, so I go up on the carrier, in the chain, and I sleep, and I sleep over the carrier. The train pulled slowly out of Montego Bay, St. James, for the over 80 mile journey to Kingston. In Kingston, relatives and friends sat, gazing across the platform, waiting for the train to roll in. They waited in vain. At about 11 p.m., the train reached Williamsfield, four miles from Kendall in Manchester. The train struggled up an incline in preparation for the descent into Kendall. Passengers on the train reported hearing three blasts from the train whistle. Then we heard the whistle blowing. And normally when the whistle is blowing, it means something. When something is coming on the line, the driver is giving a warning or something. And then after we heard the whistle, then, you know, everything just went berserk. Approaching Kendall, five of the cars rolled over. It was picking up speed coming down the grade until all of a sudden I hear a rambling, wrong, we're going to go, we're going to go, we're going to know what it was, and it lasted for a couple of seconds well. I just felt a sudden jolt, and that jolt probably catapulted us up into a sort of 30, 45 degree angle like this. We had the sensation of flying in through the air. I remember this distinctly. By the time we were on the floor, because we would have been thrown from wherever we were, and we were being tossed around in the, in the, in the coach. And we hit the ground, and you sort of held on to whoever was closest to you. I dropped me, dropped off of the chair, and I realized I crashed the chain crash. So I'm in my mother's lap, and then all of a sudden, everything went black, dark. And the next thing I know was just a lot of uh, mourning and crying out all around, all around me. A lot of people dropped down through the floor of our coach, through the roof of the one below it, and probably, <laughs> I don't know, don't, don't, don't probably down to the line. All I know, there are a lot of people down there bawling for help. It's a big stone catch up my coach. A man underneath my coach. But look at the man underneath my coach. He's de he not dead yet, but he's not dead. He changed up on his belly. And he made the outside. He talked to him. So the most you could do now is catch up some wood fire. Because we did the nail to our country. Then time the wood didn't nail. So make a big fire and he talked to him, talked to him, talked to him. And we are trying to move the coach and we can't move it. 
because it's so heavy. And the mafia telling us dead. The family suffered, all of them suffered varying injuries. But in fact, a cousin, um, Pat, um, Patricia, and um, my sister Angela, um, the second of the se second of the seven siblings, they suffered injuries. Didn't die on the spot, but died in the hospital. Where I was found, it was on top of a hill. The rest of the family were down in the valley with the broken coaches and whoever else. People used to ask me, or I was asked a question, so how is it that you were on a hillside and the rest of your family was down in this valley? And um, the answer was, angels took me there. So at an early age, I had the grasp of, grasp of miracles that they were very possible. Jamaicans woke up to the stunning news. Eight of the 12 wooden coaches were destroyed. Five had rolled over into a gully beside the track. This is Radio Jamaica's and the Rediffusion Network's special report on the train disaster which took place late last night near Kendall. Not long before midnight on Sunday, an excursion train bringing over a thousand members and friends of the Roman Catholic Holy Name Society back to Kingston from a day's outing in Montego Bay was derailed near Kendall in the centre of the island. The two great diesel locomotives pulling the 12-coach train were practically undamaged together with the first two coaches. The rest of the coaches were all wrecked and some were smashed to splinters. A number of the coaches overturned and tumbled down a steep hill. Others fell down a short bank on the other side of the track and two were crumpled together in a narrow cutting, thus completely blocking the tracks. Our mobile recording unit returned from the accident area this afternoon and here is the first of a number of interviews which were recorded earlier today. The interviewee is a police officer who was at the scene of the accident this morning. Sub-Inspector Pink is the sectional traffic officer for this part of the island and I believe you came over last night, didn't you? I came along here very early this morning, possibly around six o'clock. About six this morning. What was the scene like then? It was terrific. Very, very terrific to look at. There were numbers of people being killed, lying by the wrecked train and under the train. We removed up to now 145 dead on the spot, and there is a great number who died in the hospital at Spalding. So up to now, quarter past 11, the morning after, 145 bodies have been taken away from the scene. Yes. And in addition, a number have died in hospital. Quite a number. How many policemen have you got here, Inspector? Well, I would say possibly around 70. Does that include any that were rushed over from Kingston, or are these all from the Chapelton area? It includes the area, that is Manchester, St. Cath, uh, sorry, Manchester, Clarendon and uh, um, St. Elizabeth. Thank you very much indeed, Inspector. Later, the police count went up to 154, and it is now estimated that at least 170 have died. The original count of 145 mentioned in the interview with the police inspector came after bodies had been extracted from only seven of the nine derailed coaches. 186 people died. Over 700 were injured. Never uncle now, we need for one yard. Because he said, I want a dead man. Where I have to lift up and I look for it. You know the connection, the thing that connects some of the trains? You see people's bodies stuck on it like you push a pinch or a leaf. I only remember that they say, one of them, a lady was down in the precipice and, and a big thing was holding her down and she hold up her hand and say, help, help. And the boy just come along and say, put up your hand. And she put up her hand and it got her ring and her watch and everything and push her back down into the, push her back down and say, go dead now. I remember also vividly that while we were there, you had this long line of corpses just sitting, laying there, and people walking, you know, to see if they recognized anybody. And I remember we 
went and we took a, a look right down the line. Just one look to see if he saw anybody that he recognized and then that was it. One of my friends said he did a whoop watch for the man. You understand? That means you can't keep my check off watch for dead people. And he's dead technically too. September 8, 1957 was observed as a national day of mourning. The carnage on the rail was a watershed moment. There were increased safety measures. Wooden coaches were replaced by metal ones. Some say the crash was due to overcrowding. The Railway Commission of Inquiry pointed to the fact that the brakes had been tampered with. Somebody had threatened to cut the light, but instead of cutting the light, they cut the air line that carried that holds the brake. And that's what, because nothing, the two engines that pulled the train were in front, and nothing was wrong with the two engines. They were perfect on the line, and they had brakes. But the weight of the coaches that come down, coming down the hill, when the engine applied its brake, it could stop, but the train buff into it and, and somersault over. 2018 marked 61 years since the Kendall crash happened. The big question is, who tampered with the brakes? Many of those who died in the accident on September 1, 1957 were members of the St. Annie's Catholic Church. The church ministered to family members to help them deal with the tragedy. This plaque in memory of all those who lost their lives in the Kendall train wreck of September 1, 1957 is erected here at the St. Annie's Church in Kingston. Over 60 years later, the Kendall train crash is still etched on the minds of Jamaicans. It's still not proven who was responsible. I am Marlon Samuel.